Hey guys, Dr. Andre Pineset, the pre-med productivity expert. And today's video comes from a conversation I had yesterday with a student and his father about possibly working with me. In this video, you're gonna learn the three ways in which the overemphasis on the word free and the hookup are crippling black development and achievement in America. So I'm gonna do a chalk talk today on the board. Free. The three ways that free is killing us one is free education. Two, free programs. And number three is free money. In the black community, we believe in free education, free programs, and free money. Free, free, free. And it is absolutely destroying us from within. I'm going to break down each one of these. So first up, free education. All right. So the whole reason for this video, <laughs> blacks in America are doing awfully in higher education. We have higher dropout rates. We have worse graduation results as a, as a consequence. We are unhirable right? because we haven't graduated college all these trickle effects. The net result is the black community is not increasing their station. They're actually staying stagnant and actually going down because other minority groups are actually on the come up, right? But blacks are not doing that because we're not attaining education. Why are we not attaining education? Because we don't invest in education. And I see this all the time. And this is what happened in my meeting yesterday is I was contacted by a gentleman whose son is a high school football athlete big time athlete and <laughs> would be recruited by a lot of schools, but his recruiting is suffering because he can't get the grades. So I meet with this guy and his son, and this is a, a black father's son, and we're talking about how I can help his son. And right off the bat, I can clearly identify his son is, does not have any foundation academically. He struggles mathematically, reading wise, composition wise. And I was explaining to him that there's some very core fundamentals that are easily <laughs> taught that I could give to his son, teach, teach him, and it would drastically improve his grades and allow him to qualify for an NCAA scholarship. And then the dad was like, this sounds great, it's amazing, how much? And I told him my fee for working with students, and he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't have that kind of money, we can't afford to pay that for tutoring for my son. And I said, <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him and I, I had to laugh right in his face. And it's only because I've seen this so many times that he says he can't afford it. They don't have the money. At the same time, he and his son both have brand new LeBrons. Both of them matching brand new LeBrons. 200 and some odd dollar shoe. Both of them have them on. Furthermore, earlier in the conversation with this whole thing about how, oh yeah, we've been putting so much effort into football and making him great. He's going to make it to the NFL. And how he pays a trainer every week to work with his son $75 a week to work with his son every week. And they've been doing this for like five years from before high school. Now he's a, a junior in high school. They've been working since before high school together, $75 a week. Now, $75 a week, right? 52 weeks in a year. What is that? How many dollars a year? Let's break it down. Right? We'll average it to 50. Okay? And that's just half. So it's 37.5 and a zero. You already got that? $3,750 a year is what his dad spends on football training. I told him with two hours, I could have his son at the point where he could qualify easily for the NCAA. I charge $295 an hour. Right? That's less than $600. So we'll call it $600. So he pays this a year for five years, and he's not willing to pay me $600. Additionally, I mentioned the two LeBrons on their feet which would be about the equivalent of my $600. Not willing to invest in education. And it's killing us, guys, because other people, right, other communities believe in investing in education. You look at other racist parents and they pay for tutoring, right? They pay for test prep. And I can't tell you, and that's why I've been working to develop test, <laughs> test prep programs for students because in minority and poor communities, particularly in black communities, we don't pay for test prep. Why is that a problem? Because every rich kid is getting SAT, ACT prep. Not a little bit, a lot of it. Net result, their score is much higher. 
You have students who are not taking test prep classes who are doing well, but can't compete because they didn't take the expensive 30 hour course. So if we don't invest in test prep and in tutoring, how do we expect our students to be prepared, right? For, forget prepared. How do we expect our students to even qualify for college? Then if they don't have any academic skills, how can they thrive in college? How can they be prepared, right? College prep, how can they actually do well in college? And then if you want them to become doctors or lawyers or whatever, how can they do well in medical school? How can they even get to medical school? And the facts are they don't get to medical school because we haven't invested in education. And one of the stats that I read recently that's incredibly sad to me is that there were more blacks in medical school in 1978 than there were in 2014. Think about that. 1978, that's 40 years ago. 40 years, that's crazy that 40 years ago with the condition of race relations in America 40 years ago, that there would be more blacks in medical school in 1978 than there would be in 2014. And the problem is, is that again, we're not investing in education, so we're doing this where every other race is doing this because they're investing in education and the value and the come up is in education. So we have to start investing in education. And it starts with, instead of buying the expensive shoes, Instead of paying for the trainer, right? And you might say, oh, that's outlandish. I'd never pay for a trainer. But what we do in the black community, guys, and this is real, right? We're, we're being real. How about travel ball, right? How many parents, this is the other conversation I have with parents. They'll pay however many hundreds of dollars a month for travel ball. They'll pay an expensive fee, right, to fly to Vegas for a basketball tournament, to fly to Florida for a basketball tournament. But they can't kick down a couple dollars for tutoring. What sense does that make, right? It's completely illogical, but people, that's what we're doing, and that's why we're suffering educationally, and that's why we can't catch up. The next free that's killing us are free programs. Everybody wants a free program. Nobody thinks they should have to kick in for programs, right? Youth programs, oh, this is about the kids, it should be free. No, guys, it shouldn't be free. <laughs> it can't be free. That's the expectation we have for programs to help kids educationally, right, professionally, developing all these things is they should be free. But like I just mentioned about travel ball, we pay for travel ball, right? We pay for the trips. We do all these things for sports. We don't expect it to be free. Every team you've ever played on, there's a fee associated with that. But we'll pay it gladly because it's sports. It's supposed to be paid. But we don't look at development and developmental programs like that. And the problem with expecting all these developmental programs to be free right after school programs, tutoring programs, is that there is no infrastructure built, right? We are a money economy. We are a capitalist society. For businesses and programs to stay viable, they have to stay viable economically. They have to have the money to sustain themselves, the money to attract highly intelligent, valuable people to transmit their knowledge to the kids. And we don't invest in that infrastructure. We undermine businesses by saying, no, it should be free. And the problem is, is people roll out free initiatives all the time for students. And these are the programs that get grants. Oh yeah, we have this free initiative for school, kids after school. The problem is, is when the grant money disappears, and it always does, how do you maintain a free program? You can't, so the program folds and is never to return. And no one ever wants to do the same program again in a different way because they said, well, it failed once. So you can't get dollars again to fund the same program. So we're sabotaging those infrastructure programs. And we don't see, right, we nickel and dime black programs that come in and try to help the students. Oh, it should be free, it's for the kids, like we know you, we should do this, right? And I have all people all the time. Oh, I know you, I want to hook up, I want this, I want this, I want a discount, I want free, I want. But at the same time, would you do that to Nike? When you go buy those Nikes, do you haggle at the Nike counter? Oh, no, 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 not $225. I want it for free. No, because you know the price is $225. Why then do we do that with programs trying to help the kids? And at the same time, we allow other programs to come in and we'll pay for them. And we don't realize that the money's not going where it should be going. And the perfect example, and I want to put someone on blast right now because <laughs> I feel like it's important that people understand what's happening and the exact example that I'm talking about. I was part of a program called the California Alliance for Minority Participation at the University of California, Irvine. I did a summer science academy entering my freshman year. It was great, awesome experience. I stayed involved over my four years at UCI. 
I tutored in the program, I mentored in the program. My senior year actually served as director of their Summer Science Academy, coordinating all that. And I came very close with the head of that program. And she helped me out tremendously in college. After I finished college, and even during college, she would send me students who needed help for whatever type might be. Do you need tutoring? Oh, this person wants to go to medical school? Help them, show them the way. And every year I would help four or five students she would send me. Every year I'd help them, no charge, nothing. Okay? I started my business, the Pre-Med Productivity Expert, because I realized I had too many students, I couldn't help everybody out, especially for free, because I wanted to build an infrastructure to get things going. So what I did was, when I was first starting this up, I said, oh wait, I'm gonna reach out to her, I can help her students some, she's gonna send me them anyway this year, let me help them, and at the same time I can grow my business. So I sent her an email, a long email, hey, how's it going? And I explained what I'm doing, how I'm helping the students. I said, listen, you know I've been working with students for all this time, and now I figured out a way where I can formalize that and help thousands and thousands and many more students. And I said, I'd love to have an event at UC Irvine, my alma mater, Zot Zot for my anteaters. I'd like to host an event. It's gonna be all about the MCAT. We're gonna do four hours high yield MCAT prep so that all these students can then be able to take the MCAT without having to buy an expensive prep course. And I said, the beauty of this is because we're doing a big group, I'm only gonna charge the students $40 a student. $40 for four hours of instruction that prevents them from taking a course. Do you know what she said to me? Nothing. No response to my email. So I'm thinking maybe it got lost in email. So I sent her another email. Hey, I don't know if you got my previous email, but I'm talking about doing this. Isn't this a great idea? Would you like to be involved? And she writes back to me and she says, you know what, Andre? I'm actually concerned that you could be a predator and be preying on this sensitive population. We have students here who aren't familiar with college and we don't want them to be taken advantage of. That's what she said to me. She said, we can't have a, a paid event. And it was so, it, it completely threw me back because this is the same person who sends me students every year to work with and then is concerned that I'm a predator preying on the students. And what I tried to explain to her, and this is, this is again where free is killing us, is that I said $40 per student, right? For four hours for a course that would allow them then not to have to buy a prep, MCAT prep course. They could buy the books. The books are $50. All right, we'll call it, say 50 to 100. So we'll take the high end. So that means every student would pay $40 for my course, buy the books for $100. That's $140 the students would have to invest to be able to do well and compete on the MCAT. Right? And, okay, that. <clears throat> the alternative, right, which is, again, we don't see the other side of this is that she actually has a deal with one of the big prep companies, Kaplan Princeton Review, to allow them to come and offer their course at a discounted rate. Now, the average MCAT course is around $1,800. Do you know what the discount is that these companies give? 10%. So now the student is paying $1,620 for a course. How much do those companies, right, how much does it actually cost them to host those courses per student? Less than $200. That's all profit. So, she was concerned about me preying on students when I was offering them a $140 way to score excellently on the MCAT. At the same time, she allows companies that offer products for this to come into the school and so now her students end up paying $1,620 as opposed to paying $140. That's a factor of 10. So because she said it's for the kids, it should be free, she's going to allow all of her kids to pay 10 times what they could have paid to score well on the MCAT. And if you say, well, you know what, these are the big companies, you know, Kaplan, the Princeton Review, they know what they're doing in MCAT, so it should be $1,620. Well, with my study strategies, students score well on the MCAT. In fact, last year I had a student who took Kaplan's course, and no offense to Kaplan, took Kaplan's course and got a 22 on the MCAT. And if you aren't familiar, 22 is awful. It's bad on the MCAT. 22. He then worked with me. I gave him a plan, the exact plan I was going to give them, right? He went, bought the books, $140, spent eight weeks in study, and got a 36. 
That's 90, 90, 90th percentile. It's high. As a result, he's into a top five medical school in the country. Now, $140, $1620. All those minority students missed out on that because she said it should be free for the kids. At the same time, I go to non-minority organizations, host the same workshop, and they're all over it because they understand the value that, oh wait, if our kids invest $140, we're actually saving our kids $1,500. But again, we have this perception in the black community that these programs should be free. But guys, even the setup here for me to film this, I got lights, I got a camera, I got, a, <laughs> I got an app that has to record all this, I have to cut these videos, all these things, all that costs money, right? My website that hosts all this great content costs money. <laughs> all this stuff, all the time I spend, the books I buy, right? <laughs> Okay. I'm going to show you how I invest. This is a box of MCAT books. So people have been asking me which course I recommend, which books I recommend for the MCAT. Well, the MCAT got changed, and I don't want to give people old advice, so I went out and bought all the books for the new MCAT. Right? All the different companies, I bought their books. Why? So I can be informed. That's an investment in you guys that I'm making. But is that free? No. It cost me over $1,000 to order all those books. But I do that because that's what it requires. If you want expert advice, if you want the best advice, it costs money. So I just, we have to have an understanding of investing in these programs. And it starts with making donations. And actually, before the donations, it starts with us having understanding that if there is someone who's offering a program to our students, we have to do serious cost benefit analysis and understanding that, listen, even if they charge the students $10, $20, $40, what's the real value of that $40, right? Like to our first example, two hours with me, right, with that student, two ninety five an hour, that's 600 bucks. What does an average hour with a tutor cost you? 45 which they're already paying for a tutor, $45, right? Let's say they're charging $45. Every week, this kid meets with that tutor. So that means over a month, that's $180. So in two months, they spend $360. Four months, $720. So four months of tutoring is what I charge for two hours. Sounds crazy. But what if my two hours of instruction did what I said it would do, which it would, which would keep him out of tutoring? So in only four months, they would have made all their money back. For an entire school year, I've actually saved them, right? How much money? That's the perspective. We have to see that it's not about free. It's about the value that you get in exchange for your money. And you don't get the value from the tennis shoes. You don't get the value from whatever other luxury. You get the value from education and from programs of development, right? So our last, our third free, stay with me. Our last free is free money. What do I mean by free money? I mean, in the black community in large, we have the perception that we are seeking to find free money. It's the reason why we are the number one players of the lotto, which is a complete joke. It's a way to redistribute wealth from the poor to the rich because the people who play it are poor. Warren Buffett, Donald Trump, they're not playing lotto, right? <laughs> they're making real money. Instead, poor people, largely black, and the stats bear this out, play the lotto. Give that money away. Don't get the money back in hopes of that free money, right? That's the extreme case. The more common case that we see is the path of least resistance. And I see it all the time with youth sports. And back in my childhood, I was a decent basketball player, whatever. And I went to a camp in eighth grade, and it was the top 100 players, basketball players, on the entire West Coast, all in one gym, lots of college scouts, everybody's playing there. And they had Steve Lavin come into the gym. And at the time, Steve Lavin was UCLA's basketball coach. He's now an ESPN analyst. But he was the head coach at UCLA, and he, we were all sitting in the gym, 100 of us. And he asked, he asked everyone, he said, how many of you, think you're going to the NBA. And out of 100 students, 
right? A hundred of these basketball players, the top on the West Coast, everybody's hand went up, except for mine. It's a true story. Everybody's hand, that's 99 hands out of 100, went up saying they're going to the NBA. He then proceeded to lecture for 30 minutes about the real stats of the NBA, about how every year there's only two rounds of the draft. There's 20-some-odd teams. So at most, there's 60 people every year brought into the NBA. 60 total. Of those 60, only about a third actually make rosters because there's already veterans in the league. So you have about 20 people getting into the NBA every year. Out of those 20, you have foreign players. At the time, it was about a quarter of the draft was foreign players. Now, the draft is like three quarters foreign players. So really, those 20 players becomes five players a year coming out of America into the NBA. So what are the odds, <laughs> right? The odds are astronomical of getting to the NBA. But how many young black kids think they're going pro? And this kind of goes over to all minorities, but I, I see it with Hispanic students. I'll go out, how many of you guys think you're going pro? What are you going pro in? And they'll say, again, basketball, right? Soccer is a big one, right? We're going pro. You're not going pro. <laughs> you're not. But it's the perception of, oh, wait, I'm good at basketball. I'm good at this sport. This sport is easy. It's fun. I like going out and playing with my friends. So I'm going to do that for a living, right? It's the path of least resistance. It's free money in their eyes. Oh, I'm going to go be a big soccer player, the like Cristiano, right? I'm going to be out there having sexy ladies, you know, playing, looking like a model, right? They see it as free money. They don't see the effort that he has to put in to get that six pack. Right, to be one of the best soccer players in the world. We don't see the effort that LeBron James puts in to being LeBron James. Because I know plenty of 6'9", buffed out guys who are not in the NBA because they didn't work at their craft like LeBron does. But that's beside the point. My point is, is we see this thing as free money. And so we go down these paths, rappers, NBA, because we see all the glitz and glam and we think, oh man, this is gonna be so wonderful. There is no free money, guys. There is no success without hard work. We have to revamp our entire thinking and look at it like I have to, whatever I want to do, even if it's going to the NBA, I'm going to have to work hard to get there. And even within sports, so say you want to do sports, how many times do you hear about the black kid who had all the talent, right? Great talent, awful attitude, doesn't take criticism well, doesn't work hard, out of shape. How often do you hear that? Why? Because we don't want to work sometimes. There are people out there who don't want to work, who want free money. But there are no free lunches in this world. You have to actually work at it, whatever it's going to be. I know people who play professionally, and I know how hard they work. You guys think, oh, they're just eating Cheetos all day on the couch. These guys work out from sun up to sun down. They have real programs. These guys are working hard. And it's the same way in academics, the studies, again, bear it out. And one of the biggest ways they bear it out is in locus of control. If you've never heard this term before, locus of control is how we perceive what controls our destiny in our life. So having an internal locus of control, right, the opposite is an external. <clears throat> having an internal locus of control means we say, I can make anything happen. Everything that happens to me in my life is a direct result of my hard work, my effort, my focus. The external locus of control is, oh, I have a destiny. Whatever will be, will be. This just happens. If something bad happens, I cannot control that. That's what it is, right? And most of us exist somewhere here in the middle. The studies in the literature show that black students are here, our external locus of control. They say to themselves, oh, I'm not good at math. Oh, I'm not good at school. I'm good at basketball. Not having that internal uh, locus of control mindset where they say, I'm not good at school yet, and I am good at basketball now. If they work at it, they can flip that, and they can be great in school. We see this all the time. So what is being out here, what does it matter, right? What does it matter if you feel like, okay, I'm great at basketball, I'm not great at school, so I'm not going to do school, I'm going to do basketball. What happens? Well... Adversity. When you have an external locus of control, you do not deal well with adversity. Why? Because when something bad happens, it's out of your control. So no matter what you do, it's going to happen because it's out of your control. 
So when our students get to college and they have a setback, oh, dang, I felt an F in that class. They don't see it as an opportunity to grow and say, okay, what did I do wrong? How can I do better? I can do better next quarter. They see it as, oh, I'm not meant to be a doctor. Pre-med is too hard. I'm going to switch. Right? That adversity. Additionally, right, what does external locus control do? It actually impacts It impacts the way students study and approach classes. The literature shows that black students actually have less ability to push through problems and be creative. And you gotta follow me here for a second. If you don't like adversity, you're not gonna rustle and tussle with the material. And if you don't, anyone who knows about studying, right, you have to go through it and kind of rub it in your head and, and manipulate it around. And all the hours you spend ends up in you having more of an understanding of the material and allows you to be more creative and more fluid, right, in your understanding and your applicability of that knowledge. Well, if you don't like adversity, you can't get here and you can't be fluid and creative with the material. Additionally, right, if you're not fluid and creative, you're not spending a lot of time with the material, what does that lead to? STU, short-term understanding. So you don't have the long-term retention that's required to do well in the next semester's class. So then you have to go back and relearn the previous semester, learn the new semester, and it's too hard. So you suffer. As a consequence, like I mentioned in the beginning, blacks have the highest dropout rate, blacks have the highest change of major rate, right? All because of this guy, external locus of control. It makes a big difference, right? That's a problem. I hope you guys can understand that free, right, is killing, killing the black community. And we have to do a frame shift and an understanding that we have to invest first and foremost in education. We need to stop putting our dollars into sports and stuff that is trivial and start investing in things that are long-term gains. Education being the number one thing. We have to pay for tutoring. We need to pay for test prep. We need to do whatever it takes to get our students prepared for the next level. The second thing we need to do is have an understanding that we need to invest in infrastructure and programs to support our students. Because what happens is, is these programs get started up in other areas where people are willing to put the funds in that are necessary to keep the programs going. When we do this, we'll be able to grow the support infrastructure around our education. So now we're investing in our individual student education when we invest in programs, then we can invest in our community's education. The third and last thing is understanding that there is no free lunch and that we're going to have to invest our energy, our effort, our resources into ourselves and work, guys. We've got to work and push to get where we want to go. And I'm going to tell one last story to highlight what I'm talking about. And that's the culturally biased test thing, right? I had a video about acing the MCAT. And a student wrote on my video that I was being a hypocrite because I'm promoting disadvantaged and underrepresented students getting to medical school, but then I have a video about the MCAT. And her argument was that the MCAT is culturally biased and that no black student can do well as a, as a white student because it's culturally biased. And I explained to the student, I tried to, she wouldn't listen, that the test is not culturally biased. The test is hard and it's hard for everyone. It is biased in the sense that white students tend to be, like I talked about, more prepared, have the academic abilities, so therefore they're, right, they have an advantage to do well on the test. But you cannot reverse that disadvantage by blaming the test and saying, hey, it's biased, I'm disadvantaged, I can't get over the hump. You have to work and get over the hump. If you're, right, if you're behind, you gotta work doubly hard to catch up. And that's what I'm trying to promote. A lot of my videos are all about, right, the mentality, the toughness. You've got to understand that just because you're disadvantaged does not mean that you're actually disadvantaged. It actually means that you're advantaged. In my case, right, getting to medical school was not easy. It was difficult. It was hard. It was, right, it was hard. But what got me through was the three things I talked about. First, investing in education. My parents started it off. They invested in my education. They made sure if I'd understand something, I had a tutor. They made sure, wait, if you need to go to this school, we're going to make it happen. If you need this book, we're going to make it happen. They invested in my education. 
I continued that investment in my education by buying things, books. I buy books. I'm on Amazon. I'm Amazon Prime. I must be their number one customer because I'm constantly buying books. I have more books than I can read. I'm like 50 books behind and I keep ordering more books because I see a book and I want to learn about that topic. And the net consequence of my parents investing in my education and then me investing in my education is that I have so much wisdom and knowledge in my brain that's valuable, that gives me right job opportunities. People will pay me for the knowledge I have attained and it's all because I invested in my education. You continue that. My parents have invested in infrastructure for me. They didn't care what programs cost, right? Of course, they look for the good deal, but they wanted to make sure that the value of the program was there for me, and if the program had value, sign them up, sign them up, sign them up. And I hated some of the stuff at the time, but it was amazing because all those experiences have shaped and made me who I am. The last thing is investing effort. I mentioned, right, I'm doing these videos, I'm buying these books, I'm investing my time, my effort, and resources to better myself every single day. And you may have seen this in one of my other videos or heard me talk somewhere or talk to me individually, but every day I invest a minimum of 30 minutes into myself. 30 minutes about bettering myself, reading about something that's gonna benefit me every single day. And if you do that, guys, the minutes add up and it's gonna make you a better person. So understanding, right, nothing is free. We have to invest in education, in infrastructure and in ourselves and in our own development and that is how the black community can achieve I hope I've made that clear I know right this is a, a kind of a last-minute chalk talk but I had the conversation yesterday and I had to put something together because it was just I couldn't even sleep last night it was bothering me so much to see this kid sit there with his brand new LeBron's on $75 a week trainer and his dad saying they can't pay me to change his kids life to open up doors the scholarship money he would get if he got his grades together. We've got to change this mentality, guys. It's killing us. So that's all I got for today. This is Dr. Pineset, the premium productivity expert. If you see this video, guys, I'm giving it to you real. Please share my channel, share my videos, tell people about this. Again, support our infrastructure. I'm trying to provide, as I mentioned, the cost <laughs> benefit for the MCAT. I'm trying to provide resources at a price that students can afford so that way all students, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, how broke you are, you can afford to pay for something I'm offering to help you. Because the value per dollar paid is ginormous. And if you think I'm joking, I have a testimonial on my YouTube channel right now from Brandon. Right? He's a student I worked with, met with him once, we did an hour. He's gotten straight A's since that one meeting. So he paid for one hour, and now he's getting straight A's for how long without tutoring? What's the value to that? So I would hope that you guys would share my YouTube channel. If you guys see this video, please share it. Put it on your social media. Tell people about it so we can spread the awareness, so we can change things, so we can make education and achievement and success possible for all students, regardless of how dark they are, how poor they are. Let's have everybody come up, guys. So thank you very much again. Dr. Pineset, the Premier Productivity Expert. My website, premedproductivity.com. If you want courses, I've got them, dominatepremed.com. Or you can go to premiumproductivity.com, click courses, and you get it from there. I offer coaching, right? One-on-one -on -one coaching, I just mentioned. I also <laughs> offer group sessions. I do talks all around the country all the time. Check my events page. If I'm in your area, please come out. If I'm not in your area, you want me in your area, contact me. We can set something up. But thank you guys very much. Have an excellent, excellent night. And as always, comment in the box. Let me know you like this video and let me know what your thoughts are. What do you think? Do you think I'm wrong? If you think I'm wrong, you're wrong. No. <laughs> Tell me why I'm wrong. Let's have a discussion about it so we can solve this problem and have everybody on the come up. So thank you guys very much. Good night.